First, I'd like to thank the Senator Kolbeck and his staff for inviting me to participate in this very unique uh, conference. Uh, I'll be talking about the study conducted by the National Toxicology Program. The National Toxicology Program is widely recognized as the premier institute for conducting toxicity and cancer studies in experimental animals. The studies provide data that are used for assessing human health risks and developing strategies then to prevent adverse effects from an identified risk. Uh, the nomination of cell phone radiation to the National Toxicology Program came from the Food and Drug Administration. And the request was made because they wanted to see toxicity studies in experimental animals so that the data would be available to provide the basis to assess human health risks. And the reason for this was that exposure guidelines that existed at the time and exist now are based on protection from acute injury. This is short-term injury due to thermal effects, but they may not be protective against non-thermal effects from chronic exposure. So we undertook the project to test uh, the guidelines in terms of their adequacy. So the FCC guidelines, as I mentioned, are designed to protect from adverse effects that might occur due to increases in body temperature. This is where the FCC value <laughs> guideline came from. This was based on measurements in monkeys where the temperature rise from exposure was maintained at less than one degree centigrade. A calculation was made based on that and came up with an SAR, which is the absorption rate per mass of tissue of four watts per kilogram. The issue then that came up is what would be safe since this was considered to be the threshold for any type of adverse effects. They divided that value by 10 for workers. So the value for workers is 0.4 watts per kilogram. For the general population, it was a division by 50 to come up with 0.08 watts per kilogram averaged over the whole body. But there's two differences in exposure. One is whole body and one is local tissue level. So our focus was more on the local tissue level because if you want to understand the risk to a particular tissue, it's not what the whole body is necessarily exposed to, it's where is the radiation. So if this is an antenna, if I hold it next to my head, this is where the radiation is. We're interested in what is the risk in this area. If I divide this by my whole body weight, I'm diluting out the effect that's considered within the brain where the risks are considered to be most, of most concern. So there's a lot of discrepancy which goes on about the NTP study. Uh, the whole body level was higher, but the focus, as far as I'm concerned, and most others, are that what is that local level for assessing human risk? Oops. Okay, the studies were done in animals. Why use animals? Okay, first of all, the biological processes of disease are similar in animals and humans. Second, it is unethical to test for cancer in humans. We can get back to that later. Every known human carcinogen is also carcinogenic in animals. With a study in animals, we're controlling the exposure. So when you conduct a human study, there's always the issue of confounders other factors influencing the outcome. The animal study is very controlled. Also, with an animal study, you can eliminate the need to wait for sufficient human cancers before developing public health strategies. So the hypothesis at the time, or the assumption at the time, was that radiofrequency radiation cannot cause adverse health effects because there's not a sufficient energy to break chemical bonds or cause DNA damage. So we challenged that hypothesis, and the study was designed to provide information so that data would be available to assess potential human health risks 
for any detected adverse effects. So first, we, we conducted these studies in what are reverberation chambers. These are stainless steel chambers. You could uh, put two carts of animal cages with 100 cages housing individually animals, 100 animals within a reverberation chamber. There's an activated antenna within there and a paddle to distribute the electromagnetic environment to make a statistically homogeneous environment. Uh, this was demonstrated, and that's why we undertook this project in reverberation chambers. Next, we conducted a, what's called a thermal pilot study because we wanted to determine what would be the level of radiation that would hold body temperatures to less than a one degree centigrade rise in temperature. We did this with both GSM and CDM modulations, which are used for cell phone communications. Uh, we then conducted what's called a pre-chronic study. These are one to three months to determine what would be the power levels that we could use for a cancer study. And then we conducted the chronic study, which is the actual cancer study, determine the effects, including cancer, of modulated radio frequency radiation with only, you know, there's 90 animals per dose group and the exposures were SARs of 1.5, 3, and 6 watts per kilogram. Uh, as I mentioned before, 1.6 watts per kilogram is the current guideline for local exposures in tissues. So we're not really that different, but consider we're dealing with 90 animals per group and we want to understand risk of one in a million, not one in a hundred. Okay, there's a couple of terms I just want to give you the definition because these come up in the next slide. There's clear evidence of carcinogenicity within the animal studies, which means that there is a dose-related increase in malignant tumors or a combination of malignant and benign tumors. Some evidence means that the response might be a little weaker but there is still an increase in malignant, benign, or combined tumors. And equivocal evidence doesn't mean that there's nothing. It means that there's a marginal increase in tumors that may be related to the agent. The findings within the NTP study were that there was clear evidence for both GSM and CDM, a modulated radio frequency radiation for schwannomas of the heart. This is the... Uh, insulating tissue around the nerve of the heart. Uh, this was in male rats, it was equivocal in female rats. Also, brain gliomas, these are brain cancers. There was some evidence for both G GSM and CDMA. There was some evidence for adrenal gland tumors. And for other sites, prostate, pituitary, pancreas, liver, there was equivocal evidence, meaning there was an increase, but it wasn't clear enough to say whether this was truly an effect, but it doesn't mean that it's not an effect. So the key findings from the NTP study were that cell phone radiation caused cancers and preneoplastic lesions. I should mention that when NTP comes up with a definition of clear or some evidence, it's more than just statistics. It also includes whether or not the tumors are uncommon, which both the heart and the brain tumors are uncommon and whether there's also precancerous lesions, which don't go into the statistics for the tumor response, but they tell you that something is happening. For both the brain and the heart, there were precancerous lesions in addition to the tumors. There was also DNA damage in the brain cells of rats and mice. There was a heart muscle disease called cardiomyopathy, which occurred in both male and female rats, very much dose-related. And the male and rats were exposed from pregnancy through two years of their life. And at birth, there was a reduction in birth weight of rats. So what do we learn from this? The assumption now that non-ionizing radiation cannot cause cancer or other health effects other than tissue heating is definitely wrong. To compare this to what we know about human studies, uh, in the NTP studies, there was cancers in the heart, schwannomas, and brain gliomas. The International Agency for Research on Cancer determined that the radio frequency radiation is possibly carcinogenic to humans. This was based on findings from multiple studies 
of increases in gliomas and acoustic neuromas, which are uh, tumors, uh, Schwann cell tumors of the vestibular schwannoma of, of the ear, and both the interphone and Swedish control studies. What's the next expected steps? FDA asked for the study. We provided the study. They have the data. They need to use that, follow the intent of that study and conduct the quantitative risk assessment to assess what is the level of risk associated with exposure. Because of the widespread use of cell phones, uh, even a small increase in risk would have a serious public health impact. And in the meantime, rather than telling people, if you are concerned, this is what you can do, the health agencies need to promote precautionary measures, especially for children and women, because in children, the risks could be greater due to the increased penetration, as well as the sensitivity of the developing brain to uh, da tissue damaging agents. So finally, what is the lesson learned? We should no longer assume that any current or future wireless technology, including 5G, is safe without adequate testing, because to not do so is not ethical. Thank you.